Okay, welcome to the hypnosis part of the module. Good to see you all here, nine o'clock Monday morning. What I want to do is to tell you about some things we do know about hypnosis. Uh, there's a lot we don't know, which is why I research hypnosis. One thing we'll talk about later is, in another lecture, is why some people are more hypnotizable than others. We don't really know. Uh, that's a mystery, and that's what uh, makes the field interesting. Lots of things we don't know. But on the other hand, there are a lot of things we do know. And for example, a lot of the beliefs people have about hypnosis are false. So what I'd like to do in this series of lectures uh, is to deal with the basic facts about hypnosis and correct some of the myths about hypnosis. So you have, a, you have an understanding of what it is and what it isn't. And as you'll see, we'll steer a middle path between skepticism and the sorts of beliefs uh, that some people have. So first of all, it would be a good idea just to go over what hypnosis is uh, descriptively. Maybe a good way of doing that is to uh, take you through some of the suggestions uh, and procedures that are used in hypnosis. Some of you might have taken part in our screening program. Uh, every year uh, here at the university, we screen several hundred people for how hypnotizable they are. And so a lot of these suggestions, if you've done that, will be familiar to you. If you haven't taken part in our screening program, I would uh, recommend it just for you to see, uh, to have some interesting experiences. One thing we do know about hypnotizability is if you've never been hypnotized before, your assessment of how hypnotizable you are correlates only to a very small degree to how hypnotizable you actually are. So you won't know whether you're capable of having these sorts of experiences until you actually sit down and give it a go. Unless, of course, you say, no one can hypnotize me. Uh, then it's unlikely to happen. But if you're open to the experience, uh, then who knows what you will experience until you try it. First of all, there's a procedure we call, or is called the induction. That implies it induces a state, a state of hypnosis. That's what the English language naturally implies when you say an induction or induce hypnosis. But whether or not there is a special state of hypnosis or whether or not that state is causal in making people more responsive to suggestions is an issue that we'll be talking about next lecture and not one we want to take for granted. Nonetheless, the normal terminology is to call this an induction and the procedure typically consists of uh, the hypnotist repeating in a monotonous, relaxed, maybe rhythmic voice that you're becoming more and more sleepy, more and more relaxed, more and more hypnotized. You're slipping deeper and deeper into a hypnotic trance, and so on for about 10 minutes. We will discuss later whether there's anything special about this procedure, that whether there's anything that has to be part of it, whether there are elements we can take away, uh, and so on. But at least the traditional procedure um, involves repeated suggestions for sleep, relaxation, and trance, as I say, for about 10 minutes. Although typically, uh, in a clinical or academic context, once a person has first been through a hypnosis session and been through a 10, 15 minute induction, in the future that induction can be considerably shortened and indeed it might be shortened to the extent that a hypnotist uh, says something like, now in the future, now that you've had the experience of hypnosis, in the future, any time I say, now you're hypnotized, you'll be hypnotized. And so the induction phase becomes shortened to a single sentence. Then after the induction, some specific uh, suggestions can be given. And I've listed types of suggestions here in the order of difficulty, in the sense of um, the percentage of people who will be able to experience uh, these sorts of suggestions. So the easiest ones are motor suggestions, which means some behavioral action has been suggested. For example, relatively easy is uh, the hand is so heavy that it's falling. And a bit more difficult is the hand is so light that it's rising as if by itself, that it's rising just by itself. Again, a, a suggestion that almost everyone can experience is magnetic hands. So the suggestion that your hands are like magnets and you feel a magnetic force and you can feel the force pulling the arms together, and the arms are moving together. And I right now can feel the force between my hands 
pulling them together. So those sorts of suggestions, the motor suggestions, uh, most people, a good 90% of people, uh, would be able to experience some sort of effect uh, from the suggestion. A bit more difficult are challenge suggestions, which can be of the motor variety. What happens in a challenge suggestion is you're told to try to do something, but the suggestion is that you won't be able to do it. So, for example, with a rigid arm suggestion, you're told your arm is rigid, like an iron bar, so rigid that if you're to try and bend it, you'll find it very hard, if not impossible, to bend it. And then you're challenged, you're told, now try, try and bend your arm, just try and bend it. And then the, about 50% of people will pass that rigid arm suggestion in the sense that uh, it will seem to them that they couldn't bend their arm when challenged to do so. And then the most difficult suggestions are the cognitive suggestions or the perceptual cognitive suggestions. And these involve alterations in how you perceive or think about the world. Hallucinations are suggestions that you will perceive something. Positive hallucination is the suggestion you'll perceive something that isn't there. So if I suggested a pink elephant right there by the door, and it seemed to you you saw a pink elephant right there by the door, that will be a positive hallucination. Or the suggestion to hear music when there's no music there, or voices when there are no voices there, that will be a positive hallucination. The negative hallucination is the converse. That's a suggestion you'll not be able to perceive things that are there. So you could say to, people, uh, to someone, uh, it, it could be very global, like uh, you've lost your hearing, you're deaf, or you're blind, uh, or you can't see something in a certain region of space, or you can't see the red things, or you can't see the square things, you can't see the animals, and so on. So that's a negative hallucination, that you will not perceive something that is there. And that's a sort of cha a cognitive challenge suggestion, uh, and they're particularly difficult. Amnesia, the suggestion you'll forget what happened, often for the duration of the hypnotic session, but it might be amnesia for something specific uh, that you're shown. Age regression, the suggestion you'll go back and it will seem to you that you're a five-year-old child again, say, and you'll think and act like a five-year-old. The post-hypnotic <laughs> suggestion is a suggestion that you'll do something or experience something when you come across a certain cue after the hypnotic session has ended. So it's post-hypnotic. Uh, you've been brought out of hypnosis, and uh, you might be given the suggestion, for example, that uh, when you come out of hypnosis, uh, whenever you hear a knock, your right eyebrow will be itchy, and you'll rub it. So that'll be a post-hypnotic suggestion because the hypnosis session is finished, uh, and then the, the hypnotist or someone else makes a knocking sound, and if you feel your right eyebrow is itchy and you rub it, you pass the post-hypnotic suggestion. This is often accompanied by the suggestion of amnesia for the post-hypnotic suggestion so that you'll forget that you're given the post-hypnotic suggestion and you'll not know that you're rubbing your eye eyebrow because of the knock. So you'll just think, oh, my eyebrow's a bit itchy. I think I'll rub it now. Now, the cognitive suggestions are quite difficult in the sense that only about 10% of people will reliably respond to those suggestions. So as I've been uh, mentioning, not everyone responds to all suggestions, and there's a distribution of a degree of responsiveness or ability to respond to hypnotic suggestions. And the only way we can really tell if a person is hypnotically responsive uh, or the degree to which they are is to take them through a number of hypnotic suggestions and to see how they do. We'll be talking about hypnotizability in another lecture, but I'll just say for now that uh, it's not correlated uh, with any major personality dimension. It is not really correlated strongly with anything else that we know about. For example, it's not correlated with how extroverted or introverted you are, uh, with how anxious or neurotic or stable you are. However, it is something that's stable. So one study they measured hypnotic suggestibility 25 years apart got a very high correlation between the two measurements. So it's, it seems to be reliable uh, and stable. 
And so there's something interesting there to be explained that we're trying to explain. In order to measure suggestibility, there's some uh, standard measuring scales. In the 50s and 60s, the, the, the standards were the Harvard group scale of hypnotic susceptibility, where you can test large groups of people at the same time. And the standard, uh, the, the Stanford hypnotic susceptibility scale, uh, which is a one and one testing procedure um, and is regarded as the gold standard. The, the trouble with the Harvard, it's a good scale, but it doesn't have very difficult suggestions in. Uh, the Stanford has some quite difficult suggestions in, so it's good for picking up very highly suggestible people. But it is one and one, and it's, so it's very intensive. So imagine 10% of people are highly hypnotizable. So you need to screen 100 people to find 10 people who are highly hypnotizable to do further experiments on. Uh, if you're doing one-on-one -on -one like the Stanford requires, uh, each person will take more than an hour to screen by this method. So that is just very intensive. Because of that, um, in the 90s, Kenneth Bowles developed the Waterloo Stanford group scale for notic susceptibility, which is taking some of the, uh, the more difficult suggestions of the Stanford, but uh, arranging it so that it could be run in, in larger groups. And, and it's essentially the Waterloo scale that we use at Sussex if you've taken part in any of our screening. Another one developed in the 80s. Um, I guess in order to be quick, because these other scales take an hour, more than an hour, the Carlton uh, is shorter, involves about half the number of suggestions, but it's correspondingly less reliable. So there's, there's a trade-off there. So the main thing I want to say about this, and we'll talk about hypnotizability later, is that there's a distribution of suggestibility. That's the thing to remember, that only about 10% of people will reliably respond to almost any sort of suggestion. 10% of people also just won't experience hardly anything, and most people uh, most of you, you'll experience some things uh, to some degree and uh, not other things, and you're called the mediums. Now, one of the first theories of hypnosis that you'll come across, and just if you're chatting about hypnosis in the pub or anywhere else, is the very skeptical reaction, aren't they just faking it? So that theory would need to deal with first, because if, if subjects were just faking their hypnotic responses, then there isn't that much of scientific interest here to pursue further. Now, a general methodology for picking apart uh, people just reacting to how they believe they should be responding from what you might call genuine hypnotic uh, experiences and behaviors was developed by Martin Orne. He is a psychiatrist of Pennsylvania. He used hypnosis in his clinical practice. He was convinced of its effectiveness. And he was also convinced that he could tell apart real hypnosis or real hypnotic response from someone who was faking. Well, but how can you, how do you know that? You might think you can tell them apart, but uh, the, only way to tell for, the only way to tell for sure is to have some people who are faking and some people who are really responding and see if the hypnotist can tell them apart. And this is the essence of the real simulator design uh, developed by Orne. So he coined the term demand characteristics, which is now a common term within psychology, to indicate all those aspects of a situation that tell you how you should be behaving. So that will include uh, explicit things that the experiment or the hypnotist might say, but also more subtle aspects of their body language, of their intonation, uh, anything that might give you a cue as to what you should be doing and how you should be doing it. But demand characteristics would also include general cultural beliefs and everything you know about hypnosis that will feed into telling you exactly how you should be performing uh, in order to satisfy what you think is expected of you by the experimenter or the hypnotist. So what Orne suggested is we should do is we'll take some low hypnotizables 
Now, the reason why you take the lows is that they won't accidentally slip into hypnosis and really experience hypnosis. So we'll take some lows, and that will be our simulators. They're told, in a moment, you're going to go and meet a hypnotist. He doesn't know if you're a low or a high. So by a high, I mean highly hypnotizable, and a low, a lowly hypnotizable, as determined by some of the instruments we talked about before. But these lows are told, you've got to pretend to be a highly hypnotizable person, and you've got to do a good job of it, because if the hypnotist can tell that you're not really hypnotized, he's going to tap you on the shoulder and ask you to leave. So do your best to fool that hypnotist. And the highly hypnotizable people just go in and be themselves. So then the, the hypnotist doesn't know who's a real and who's a simulator, uh, and they'll take them through some suggestions or some tasks, whatever the experiment might involve, and afterwards they say which was which, who did they think were the reals and who were the simulators. Now, the first thing that surprised Orn was that when this was done to him, he couldn't tell apart the reals and the simulators. In other words, people can do a good job of acting, being hypnotized. So that raises the question, well, what about the highs? Are they just acting? Well, what Orn said was, um, what we need to do is to do uh, a lot of experiments with this, take sensitive measures. What we see in the simulator's behavior is the demand characteristics. Simulators are telling us everything about the situation uh, that informs you about how you should be performing. Now, the reels will be sensitive demand characteristics as well, but in addition, um, they might express what you might call genuine hypnotic effects that are independent of demand characteristics. So now, if you uh, find a difference between reels and simulators, that difference reflects the genuine hypnotic effects above and beyond demand characteristics. Now, if you don't find a difference, the logic's a bit more difficult to draw, it's a bit more difficult to draw firm conclusions from, because it might just be there are genuine hypnotic effects that happen to match the demand characteristics, and so people can act them up if you tell them to act. Of course, if all you ever found was no difference between simulators and reels, the simplest theory would be there just is demand characteristics. But a single experiment wouldn't lead you to dismiss, dismiss uh, hypnosis as not being genuine, but a whole series of experiments could do that. So that's the logic of the real simulator design. So now let's apply this in a couple of experiments to see are reals in effect just simulators. So in this first experiment, uh, I'll consider here that I used reals and simulators, but also um, a lie detector. And by a lie detector, I mean a device that you put onto people's hands fingers that measures the degree of electrical conductivity of the skin. And the reason why you measure that is uh, for many people, when they lie, they sweat. It's just an automatic reaction that's hard to overcome. And when you sweat, your skin conducts electricity better. So essentially what we're measuring here is the degree to which people are sweating. And this, the first slide here is just an illustration of how you can elicit this response from asking people to lie. Even telling people it's okay to lie because you're telling them to lie will, in many people, elicit a sweat response and you, and you get a yeah, SCR, skin conductance response. The way they did that was to have a set of cards, subjects looking at it, and they might be told this is a lying trial, and you're asked, is it an apple? And if it's a lying trial, you've got to lie about that and say yes if it's not an apple and not if it is an apple. Or you're told to tell the truth. Now you see here that on these um, critical trials where you're asked to lie, people do sweat more than when they're asked to tell the truth. Now this is an average response over many trials. So what you, you can't do with uh, the skin conductance is reliably indicate for any one trial whether the person is lying or not. There's too much noise there, you see. You have to average over many trials to get rid of that noise. 
So that, that's why polygraphy or lie detection isn't a very reliable method for telling if someone is lying about any single question. But if you ask a whole b bunch of questions and average over them, you can get in a sense of the, of, uh, a rough sense, I should say, of the overall degree of, of truth telling for that set of questions. So now, there's two lines here. One is in the so-called waking state, which means not hypnotized. And the other is when people are given a hypnotic induction. And that's just to check that after hypnotic induction, people will respond in the same way on this test as with a hypnotic induction. Indeed, they do. You see these two lines here uh, essentially doing the same thing. Now, let's take the subjects who responded well on this test in the sense they did reliably sweat more uh, on the critical lying trials rather than the truth-telling trials. Now we'll apply it to hypnosis. So we'll, we'll ask for the suggestions, the extent to which they actually experienced the suggestion. So, for example, on the rigid arm suggestion where you're asked to try and bend the arm and the highs, these top 10% of responders to hypnotic suggestions, so they tend to pass most suggestions and they, they pass the rigid arm suggestion, meaning they say, I can't bend my arm, I'm trying, but I can't bend it. And then you say to them, with the lie detector, uh, the, uh, the skin conductance response, measuring the skin, skin conductance response, were you really unable to bend your arm? Now, on this test, test <clears throat> only 35% of responses for simulators come out as truth-telling, uh, but 89% of responses for reals. Now, that's a massive difference. So the conclusion from this is reels are not behaving like simulators. Now, there's one possible misinterpretation about this I just want to draw out, draw out which, which comes back to the point I said about noise. We can only tell roughly over an average of a set of trials whether roughly the person was telling the truth or not. So when we have here 35% of responses of simulators met the skin conductance response criterion of truthfulness, that doesn't mean that 35% of responses from the simulators were real hypnotic responses, that they really responded to the suggestion. These people have been selected to be lows and not responsive to these suggestions. So probably, I don't know quite how low these people were, but there's a good chance they really didn't experience any of those suggestions. And this 35% there is just an indication of the level of noise you have in the uh, lie detector test. And the same for the 89% of responses for reels. That doesn't mean that there was 10% of cases where the reels were lying. We don't know that. Maybe there was and maybe there, was, there wasn't. This, the best guess of what's going on here is 89% just reflects the fact there's some noise there. So, of course, sometimes you're telling the truth, it's going to come out the other way just because like all measurements in the known universe, it's noisy. But one thing we can say for sure is there's a huge difference between reels and simulators. And that's the key point. And that's one thing that we can say. Reels as a group are not like simulators as a group on the lie detection task. And this is just really another way of plotting the same data. You find the average skin conductance response uh, for the for the uh, critical hypnosis questions, like can you really bend your arm, and to neutral questions like are you relaxed. So the, the simulators come out as, on average, sweating a lot more on the hypnosis questions than on the neutral questions, i.e. they come out as, on average, lying a lot, which is what they've been told to do, right, the simulators. But the reels are not behaving like that in any way at all. So reels are a very different category of people than simulators. That's what these data show. So this is evidence against the notion that you'll sometimes come across, and, in, and indeed a theory we need to take seriously uh, before we proceed any further, that people who respond to hypnosis are just putting it on. They're just faking it to have a laugh. They're just responding to the demand characteristics to give you what you want. Okay. So that theory, we can say, can't really account for these data here. These data really challenge such a theory. Uh, 
All right, so now here's a slightly different sort of experiment in that it was the same subject who was asked to fake the hypnotic response uh, and to really respond to it. And we'll come back to real simulator design in, uh, in just a few minutes. This involved uh, brain uh, scanning. And uh, the subject was given a, these are responsive subjects, uh, highly hypnotizable subjects. They're given a, a suggestion for paralysis, that they can't move a limb. And that's one condition, an image of the brain with a, with a PET uh, brain scan. And the other one, they're just asked to fake it. Now, the brain scanned in, in both conditions. And uh, what's interesting is you get difference between the conditions. So you get, in the faking condition, you get more activity in the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex rather than in the uh, apparently real paralysis, real hypnosis condition. And that's interesting because there are other studies that have looked at specifically deception and found that this area it is one of the areas that comes up when people are asked to deceive. So we get a, a difference in, in that sense, this is conceptually like the uh, skin conductance uh, study I've just been talking about. We get a difference between apparent real responding and known fake responding on a measure that we know to be sensitive to faking. And conversely, in the hypnosis, the so-called real hypnosis condition compared to the, uh, to the faking condition, you get more activity in the orbital frontal cortex which is an area that uh, is involved in processing expectations. And we'll be talking about in another lecture the role of expectancy and belief in generating hypnotic experience. So those are the two studies I want to consider for the issue of are uh, high, highly hypnotizable people faking? And the argument has been they're not faking. And I should say, that's just a sampling of the evidence. And there's, there's other evidence, for example, with brain scanning, when you suggest people that they'll hallucinate colors on a black and white image, you find the color areas V4 lighting up on uh, brain scans. So clearly, subjects aren't just saying, I see color. We see the color areas of the visual cortex um, lighting up. Also. Uh, Stuart Derbyshire has shown, who's a pain researcher, if you hypnotically increase the amount of pain or reduce the amount of pain, there's a pain matrix in the brain, and the, the degree of activity in that matches the subjective reports of subjects about the degree of pain they're feeling as you modulate it right down below the pain they were feeling as sufferers of pain, or up to be even more pain. The subjective reports of the pain they're feeling matches the activity in the pain matrix of the brain. So the consensus uh, amongst academics is that, uh, at least in an academic and clinical setting, the vast majority of responses are genuine in the sense that they correspond to the subjective experiences uh, of the subjects reporting them. So they say they see color, or they feel pain, or it's difficult to move in certain ways. That is most likely how it seems to the subject. That's not to say that faking doesn't happen. Uh, and um, where I think it happens a lot is on TV hypnosis. So I've seen TV hypnosis. And if you just think about the different, um, I've been in the uh, TV studio, and if you think about the motivations of the subjects who are in that audience, they're quite different to a person who, say, gone to see a, a clinical hypnotherapist or taken part in, in an academic experiment. So they've responded to an advert that says, do you want to be part of a Channel 4 program on hypnosis? So these are people who probably like 10 seconds of fame. And then in the TV studio, the, uh, the TV hypnotist gives suggestions. He says, sleep. Everyone does this. Uh, he gives maybe very difficult suggestions. Uh, maybe, for example, you're wearing goggles and everyone appears naked when you look at them through these goggles. Well, that involves, that involves difficult uh, hallucinations, which we know only about 10% of people will be able to experience. But the whole audience is, is uh, acting as if they're seeing everybody naked. So the degree, of, the degree of response, first of all, and the way it's hand up is the first indicator that 
this doesn't really feel like genuine hypnotic response. Yes, faking, hamming it up, that does happen in hypnosis settings, more in the entertainment industry, and probably barely at all in the clinical uh, situation, where it's not in your interests to fake. <coughs> Let's say you're being, uh, you're, you're giving birth by caesarean section, knife's going in, uh, you've been given hypnotic analgesia so you don't feel pain. You can always request chemical analgesia if you want it. Is it in your interest to fake? Would you say, let's have a great joke on this doctor by pretending I don't feel any pain? I don't think so. So, where the motivations are different, you get, and the demand characteristics are different, you can get different degrees of faking. But in an academic setting, it seems almost uh, the vast majority of responses are genuine. So that deals with um, one question about hypnosis, where we can say we do know something, uh, and that is there's more to hypnosis than faking. And that's good, because that means we can go on and investigate and say, well, if not faking, but these people are saying that uh, they can't move their limbs and they see pink elephants. Um, this is amazing. This is telling us something about consciousness, about volition, about our sense of reality and presence. So it's telling us something important about how the mind works, potentially. Because if it's not faking, it's something very interesting. Well, now, the other sort of notion one might come across about hypnosis is the feeling, or maybe the fear, that the, that the hypnotized subject becomes something like a zombie in the sense uh, they give up all of their willpower or capacity for free thinking and volitional action to the hypnotist and become some sort of slave or um, automaton, they'll just do as they're told. So the questions I want to address is, will a hypnotized person perform any immoral act suggested? Once you've hypnotized a highly hypnotizable person, can you tell them to do something that would violate their moral code? And relatedly, can a, can a hypnotized subject actively think for themselves or do they somehow become passive where their own thinking processes become quiescent. Now, Helen Crawford uh, <coughs> interviewed 22 people after a stage hypnosis show just to see uh, what sort of experiences that I had, that they had. Now, I think stage hypnosis is a sort of in-between case between, say, say, academic hypnosis and TV hypnosis. Because you do find, uh, although I think probably not enough research has been done on the genuine experiences in these, in these different settings, we do find in stage hypnosis, while some people may be uh, hamming it up, there are other people who will tell you they had genuine experiences. 86% of people reported positive experiences as interesting, exciting, uh, relaxing, and so on. But about a third of the people did experience something negative as well. They were confused or frightened. The important thing uh, for our current purposes is about a quarter of people believed the hypnotist had control over them and they could not resist. That was how it seemed to them. So here's some quotes. I would have done anything he said, but I didn't think he would make me do anything bad. I trusted him. Before I got hypnotized, I always thought like hypnosis was a partial control of your mind. Now my answer would be total control. The experimenter says, what do you mean? I felt like I could do anything when I was up on stage. If I had to kill somebody, I would certainly have done it. That's the control right there. So how it seemed to this person was they'd lost complete control and in some sense had become the sort of zombie you were talking about. Someone else says, hypnosis is a state of mind where you're vulnerable mentally to the point you'll do whatever the hypnotist asks. The experimenter queries anything. Well, not anything illegal or antisocial. So sort of in between position that maybe there are limits. So what the experiments then told the participants afterwards is, in fact, no matter how you, what you thought about your own degree of control or how it seemed to you, you did have control during hypnosis. And unlike what is sometimes thought, you would not in all likelihood have carried out suggestions that were against your desire or against your moral code. So this is what these people were told, but what we're interested in is evidence. Right? We need to know, are there good reasons for saying this or saying the opposite. 
So the investigation of this has a long history in, in hypnosis, which in fact goes back hundreds of years. But most of the early work were just sort of one-off case studies, which are very, not very rigorously controlled and it's very difficult to interpret um, what was really going on. So now let's go back to the real simulator design and look at a study carried out in Australia by Orne and uh, Evans. So now this experiment, and if you read the original paper, it's quite interesting to read about the degree of effort that went into making this experiment work in the sense of being realistic. So there was a box, uh, and one of the suggestions was to see if subjects would engage in harm to themselves by putting their hands in a box where there was a red belly black snake. Now this is a common snake in um, Eastern Australia. Um, apparently it's only rare that its bite is fatal, uh, but nonetheless it's pretty nasty. And uh, certainly if there was a red belly black snake in a box, you really wouldn't want to put your hand in it. Now. The way this was actually set up was um, the box had compartments and there was a mirror there, so it looked like the compartment you're putting your hand in, there's a snake, but actually the, the, the snake is safely constrained in another part of the box. So it looks like a snake's there, but it, but it isn't, it's actually safe. Now another aspect of this experiment was to see the extent to which the person would do something not harmful to themselves but harmful to others, would they commit an antisocial act? So there's a, a beaker of nitric acid, dissolve a coin in it, give it to the subject, and then say, now throw it in the research assistant's face. Now, in fact, as you might imagine, um, there was real nitric acid uh, necessarily in order to dissolve the coin, but it was switched for some other fizzy but perfectly harmless compound. Um, but you can tell how well this experiment uh, was done, and another one will we'll come to, by the fact that the switcheroo failed to happen at one time. So real nitric acid uh, was thrown by subject in a research assistant's face. So that shows it was a pretty realistic uh, setup. Fortunately, nitric acid doesn't actually liquefy your face um, immediately. As long as you wash it off with water quickly, no harm is done. So they went to a lot of effort to set up some dangerous situations here, and five out of six of the, of the highs who were hypnotized and suggested to do these things went through with these actions. So now, if we just stopped at this point, and if we took the literature up until this point, that's exactly the sort of thing that had been shown. You take some highs, you tell them to do something antisocial, they do it. They steal some coins, or in this case, they throw acid on people's faces. For now, and this, and this is the point of the real simulator design, but what would simulators do? Right? I mean, reals did this, but what would people do just responding to demand characteristics? And the answer is that six out of the six of the simulators also went through with these antisocial acts. So, I mean, one comment on this is no matter how realistic you set up the situation within a lab setting, the subjects probably think in the back of the mind, now come on, this is the Department of Psychology at, I think it was the University of Sydney, you know, at a university, they're not going to make this unsafe. Now seriously, if they're asking me to do this, it's going to be okay. That must be what the subjects thought, I'm presuming they're not all sociopaths here, because the simulators were willing to go through with the actions. So the subjects must have thought, this is fine, really, because they understood the greater context in which this was taking part, namely this was a psychology experiment, so of course it's okay. So while nothing actually follows from this about our key theoretical question, namely, will highs commit antisocial acts because of hypnosis, we don't know because we haven't set up the conditions to show that, because all we have are conditions where the demand characteristics are sufficient to make you think it's safe enough for you to go through with the actions. But it does raise a valuable methodological point uh, that you always need a control group and uh, simulators are a jolly good thing to have. And this issue was picked up a 
a couple of years ago on the Darren Brown show. I uh, don't know how many of you saw that. So he was interested in the same question. Could you hypnotize someone to be an assassin? Because there are reports of the CIA in, uh, looking into hypnosis to see if you could train people uh, in certain ways and hypnotize them so that they would kill without knowing that they were being an assassin. Is that really possible? So what happened was uh, you have a studio audience. Um, they're given a series of suggestions. As people pass the suggestions, people are selected gradually to the next stage of the experiment until one person was picked by Darren Brown, uh, this person here, who seemed to be responding well um, up until that point on the suggestions that were given. And um, then he was told, hyp hypnotically suggested, that he would kill someone when he sees a polka dot, a polka dot pattern. Right. So this is the assassination suggestion. He then goes to a theater where Stephen Fry is performing. Um, I think, I can't quite remember now, I think it was the lady in front was on the seats in front uh, of this, uh, this person here, was wearing a polka dot dress, and he's suddenly slipped a sheet of paper telling him, and a box with a gun in, saying, point the gun at Stephen Fry, pull the trigger, and kill him. He does so, Stephen Fry collapses on stage, and a um, person interviewed afterwards, he said uh, that he didn't know what he did, he was just responding automatically, um, he was, it was all beyond his control. Now, do you think that's good evidence? What sort of evidence do you think that is? Maybe you could just tell the person next to you, next to you do you think, does this establish that hypnosis can be used to make people perform antisocial acts and we could, in fact, would be a good technique for the CIA and other agencies, MI5 and so on, to use uh, to have assassins that will go around killing people and forget all about it. And so uh, from a, a MI5 CIA point of view would be um, a very safe way of killing people because now you have someone who will kill on command and then completely forget about it afterwards. Do we have good evidence? Just uh, say what you think to the person next to you. Any thoughts? Anybody want to say? So it's probably not good evidence. And why not? Uh, well, because uh, as far as it's on TV, the whole point of TV is you know, it's entertainment. Yeah. So it's not the only belief that he just could have been acting the whole time. And you know, there was no real significant thing either. So we have no idea whether he was actually in the size. Yes. But uh, good point. So, um, just to essentially repeat what you said, the person could be acting two ways of interpreting that. One is he could be a stooge. Remember, these TV hypnosis programs, prime importance is entertainment. They have to guarantee the, the, the show works. That's most important, not science. So, so, none of these entertainment shows, Darren Brown shows, and so on, should you take as being informative about the true nature of hypnosis. They're not scientific. So I don't know if this guy was a stooge or not, but one genuine um, <coughs> hypothesis is he could have been a stooge. But let's consider another conjecture. He wasn't a stooge at all. He was just a person who happened to be selected. But now consider the demand characteristics on this person. He knows he's on the Darren Brown show. He knows millions of people are watching him. What is he meant to do? If he doesn't pull the trigger, there's millions of people going to be bitterly disappointed. Right? Because the very strong expectation, and you have to be in a studio audience to realize just how powerful the demand characteristics become when you're in a TV situation. The 
the bright lights on you, you know millions of people are watching. It's very clear what he has to do. And if, if the subjects in the lab at the University of Sydney were willing to throw acid on people's faces in that situation, well, in a TV situation, the demand characteristics are all the more stronger. So you could predict in advance what he's, what he's, what he's going to do. He knows this must be safe as well. This is Stephen Fry. Right? He's been told to kill Stephen Fry, having been trained by Darren Brown. Obviously, it's a setup. So it uh, doesn't provide evidence one way or the other. So now I want to consider um, an experiment which is informative. Unfortunately, rather difficult to run these days because of ethics committees. But fortunately, before ethics committees uh, came into vogue, we could run experiments like this. So um, what Co did was, um, and he's replicated this once more, but I would like to see more replications of this sort of, of, this sort of study. But at least what the evidence we do have does, does give us a, a preliminary answer to our question. Remember I said when you give inductions, you can shorten them after the first time. So the experimenter said, in the future when I tell you now you're hypnotized, you'll be hypnotized. So having screened a bunch of people, uh, he, he's found some highs there. He accidentally bumps into them on campus and says, uh, at a later point in time, and says, look, I'm just a poor academic, hard to make ends meet. So I do drugs. And um, I wonder if you would help me. Could you go to this apartment, uh, deliver this uh, bag of white powder? They'll give you an envelope with, uh, with some money in. I just would like you to go up to the apartment, deliver the drugs, take the money, give it back to me. So for half the subjects, these were just plain, just a plain request. One broke academic to a poor student. Um, or it was a hypnotic suggestion. So nine of the subjects went through with the crime. Three out of 12 in the hypnosis condition. The six out of 14 in the condition without hypnosis. Now the good thing about this study is without hypnosis, we haven't hit a ceiling, right? There's plenty of scope for this number to go higher because of the hypnosis. But it doesn't go higher. So as far as we can tell, hypnosis doesn't add anything to the persuasive power of an authority to tell you to do something. And we know an authority telling you to do something can be more persuasive than you think. Hypnosis doesn't add to that. Right? And when they were interviewed afterwards, those who did go through it with it said, drugs are no problem to me. And the people who didn't go through with it said they strongly disagreed with drugs. And I say the realism of the experiment is, is, is determined by the experimenter's acting. And uh, he was almost beaten up by one subject, which shows he did a good job. All right, now just to finish, um, I'll talk about some work by Kevin McConkie, what he called the experiential analysis technique. What he did was film people responding to hypnotic suggestions, then played it back to them afterwards and asked them to recount their experiences. And subjects, highly hypnotizable subjects, often prove to be very active. For example, given the suggestion to hallucinate blue, they might uh, to hallucinate orange, they might say, I preferred blue, and they hallucinated blue. Uh, if they asked to hallucinate an object in their hand, they might first put it on the shoulder and move it to the hand. Or they might hallucinate in a different hand. In other words, subjects often experience, experience themselves as actively engaged and capable of changing the suggestions to meet their personal preferences, but nonetheless, having done that, those still have the experience of hallucinating and seeing an object there that wasn't there. So subjects, highly hypnotizable subjects, can be very active in their thinking. They're not passive zombies. So hypnotized subjects can choose how to respond to suggestions, whether to change the suggestion to suit them, or whether to respond at all and say, no, this is against my moral code. Uh, I won't take part in this. So in summary, <clears throat> I want to walk a middle path here between two claims which are widely out there but are false. First claim is subjects are just faking. No, by and large, people who pass hypnotic suggestions have genuine experiences. Second claim out there is that the other extreme is they become complete zombies and will do anything they're told. No, they have genuine experiences, but they have control. Ultimately, they have control over those experiences, uh, and they can choose if they want to, to stop the procedure from happening even if they don't know that they can do that. They can actually do that if you push them hard enough. 
All right, thanks very much. Uh, so in this lecture, I hope to just sort of debunk, as it were, two main extreme myths about hypnosis. And now in the, in the uh, remaining lectures, we'll consider uh, other things we do know about hypnosis. We'll consider altered states, if there's an altered state in the next lecture. Uh, and then we'll consider hypnosis in the clinical and historical context. And finally, we'll consider what determines different degrees of suggestibility and whether hypnosis is useful for increasing memory. Thanks very much.